Okay, so in this video, I'm going to read and annotate the last um, four pages of the chapter and the whole uh, novella. So here we go. Thereupon, I arranged my clothes as best as I could, and summoning a passing hansom. Now, a hansom is like a horse-drawn taxi. It's not that important, but a bit of context. Uh, drove to a hotel in Portland Street, another place in London, the name of which I chanced to remember. At my appearance, which was indeed comical enough, however tragic a fate these garments covered, the driver could not conceal his mirth. So even the driver hates him. Actually, sorry, at first, actually, the driver kind of uh, finds him finds him humorous. I gnashed my teeth upon him with a gust of devilish fury, and the smile withered from his face. The smile withering from his face, happily for him, yet more happily for myself. For in another instant, I had certainly dragged him from his perch. So, you know, when he then reveals his true self, it kind of horrifies the driver. Just like Hyde's appearance has kind of horrified every single character he's met throughout the whole, um, the whole book. At the inn, as I entered, I looked about me with so black a countenance as made the attendants tremble. Not a look did they exchange in my presence, but obsequiously took my orders, led me to a private room, and brought me where and brought, brought me wherewithal to write. Obsequious means kind of like um, what's the best word to describe it? If we were kind of like a, a, an informal way of saying it would be kind of sucking up to someone. Uh, so let's say uh, it's like another word for it is like servile. Yeah, acting like they that someone's your like superior and that you're like their servant. Hyde, in danger of his life, was a new creature to me, shaken with inordinate anger, strung to the pitch of murder, lusting to inflict pain. So when Hyde fears for his life, he becomes even more uh, more dangerous, really. And he, he's lusting to inflict pain. Look at these verbs here, shaken, uh, strung and, and lusting to inflict pain and hurt on people yet the creature was astute astute means uh, s uh, smart or clever mastered his fury with a great effort of the will composed his two important letters one to Lanyon and one to Paul and that he might receive actual evidence of their being posted sent them out with directions that, that they should be registered so he sends out the two letters that we saw earlier on um, in the book Thenceforward, he sat all day over the fire in a private room, gnawing his nails. There's something about perhaps some fear from Hyde there, perhaps showing a more human side to him than, than often is presented in the book. Uh, you know, he actually does feel some kind of fear about this plan. There he dined, sitting alone with his fears. Obviously, confirmation of, of his fears there. The waiter visibly quailing before his eye. Another character having that reaction to him. And thence, when the night was fully come, he set forth in the corner of a closed cab and was driven to and fro about the streets of the city. He, I say, I cannot say I. So notice this bit. We get this kind of pronoun mix up here that, that Jekyll likes to refer to him as a he and not as I. He doesn't want to admit that, Jack, that Hyde is just really part of Jekyll and that in some ways they're the same, very much the same person but he wants to create a distance between Jekyll and Hyde so he calls him he in this narration he doesn't want to call him I that child of hell again linking um, uh, Hyde to hell as he has been throughout the book really an unholy thing had nothing human nothing lived in him but fear and hatred so uh, you know again this inhuman quality of him there nothing human and when at last, thinking the driver had begun to grow suspicious, he discharged the cab and ventured on foot, attired in his misfitting clothes, an object marked out for observation, into the midst of the nocturnal passengers. These two base passions raged within him like a tempest. We get this simile here of this kind of storm that rages within Hyde. Uh, he walked fast, hunted by his fears, chattering to himself, skulking through the less frequented thoroughfares, counting the minutes that still divided him from midnight. Once a woman spoke to him, offering, I think, a box of lights. He smoked her in the face and she fled. Bit of an odd little incident here, actually. A woman you know, offers him a kind of, uh, like, a, I don't know, a cigarette or something. 
he smote, it means he struck her. So he sort of punches this woman. So pretty another little uh, glimpse of the awful things that um, that Hyde gets up to at night. When I came to myself at Lanyon's, so he kind of skips out now, Lanyon's narrative. When I came to myself at Lanyon's, the horror of my old friend perhaps affected me somewhat. So he thinks, do you remember you know, the reaction of Lanyon? He was absolutely horrified when he witnessed Hyde turn back into Jekyll. Um, and perhaps he feels affected by it. I, I do not know. It was at least but a... Turn over. A drop in the sea to the abhorrence with which I look back uh, upon these hours. A change had come over me. It was no longer the fear of the gallows. It was the horror of being Hyde that racked me. Okay, so he's no longer afraid of being killed uh, anymore as Hyde. It's just being Hyde that racks him with kind of guilt and fear. I received Lanyon's condemnation partly in a dream. So it felt like a dream, like he wasn't really, it didn't really feel real. It was partly in a dream that I came home to my own house and got into bed. I slept after the prostration of the day with a stringent and profound slumber which not even the nightmares that wrung me could avail to break. I awoke in the morning shaken, weakened, but refreshed. I still hated and feared the thought of the brute that slept within me, and I had not of course forgotten the appalling dangers of the day before, but I was once more at home in my own house and close to my drugs, and gratitude for my escape shone so strong in my soul that it almost rivaled the brightness of hope. So basically, this whole little bit here, he's talking about, he's feeling quite hopeful. He's feeling like he feels quite safe. He feels like he's full of gratitude, as we discussed yesterday. And really, he feels like, you know, like I said, refreshed here as well. This is a bit like, the, again, the calm before the storm. It happened, remember, structurally, when he was sitting on that bench in the park yesterday before he, he became Hyde. This kind of moment of feeling quite calm. I was stepping leisurely across the court after breakfast, drinking the chill of the air with pleasure, when I was seized again with those indescribable sensations that Harold did the change. So he becomes Hyde again in his courtyard. And I had but the time to gain the shelter of my cabinet. Remember, that's his little office. Before I was once again raging and freezing with the passions of Hyde. Remember, this he's always linked, isn't he, to coolness and being cold, ice and kind of uh, freezing. It took on this occasion a double dose to recall me to myself. So he needed a double dose of the drugs. So it's becoming harder to become uh, Jekyll again. And the last six hours after, as I sat looking sadly in the fire, the pangs returned and the drug had to be re-administered. So he's losing control now. He really cannot control when he's Hyde anymore. In short, from that day forth, it seemed only by a great effort as of gymnastics and only, only under the immediate stimulation of the drug that I was able to wear the countenance of Jekyll. Remember, uh, countenance is used quite a lot in the book. It means kind of a, appearance, really, or expression, appearance. At all hours of the day and night, I would be taken with the premonitory premonitory shudder above all if i slept or even dozed for a moment in my chair it was always as hyde that i awakened so every time he falls asleep he becomes he becomes hyde you know and sometimes even you know even uh, you know when he's not asleep under the strain of this continually impending doom and by the sleeplessness to which i now condemn myself i even beyond that what i had thought possible to man i became in my own person a creature eaten up and emptied by fever so he becomes kind of, Jekyll becomes ill. And he describes himself this time as a creature, um, uh, emptied of, uh, by fever, languidly weak both it, uh, in both and mind. And I think I should say in body, in body and mind, and solely occupied by one thought, the horror of my other, other self. So he's horrified. The thought of being Hyde now, which he once enjoyed and was tempted by, now he feels this absolute horror. But when I slept, or when the virtue of the medicine wore off, I would leap almost without transition, for the pangs of trans transformation grew daily less marked. So there's less of like a reaction, it just sort of happens quickly. There's less of all that build-up like we saw with Lanyon. Into the possession of a fancy, brimming with images of terror, a soul boiling with causeless hatreds, and a body that seemed not strong enough to contain the raging energies of life. So when he becomes Hyde, he's full of these images of terror. He's, his soul is boiling. Causeless hatreds. There's, there's like, there's no rational reason uh, 
for this hatred. He just feels it instinctively. Um, oh, this is a good line. Uh, the powers of Hyde. We should we should make sure we 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 that the powers of Hyde seem to have grown with the sickliness of Jekyll. So the balance there again of the power struggle between them. You know, it's a really clear um, example. As Jekyll gets weaker, Hyde gets stronger. And certainly the hate that now divided them was equal on each side. So they hate each other. Jekyll hates Hyde. Hyde hates Jekyll. You know, um, good hates evil. Although remember, Jekyll doesn't fully represent just good, really. With Jekyll, it was a thing of vital instinct. He had now seen the full deformity of that creature that shared with him some of the phenomena of consciousness and was co-heir with him to death. So... If they both, if they die, then they both die. They're co-heirs to it. They would both die. Also, interesting, we've heard about deformity throughout the whole novel. Well, here we get this idea. He has seen the full deformity. People of other characters, even Utterson, have just seen glimpses. But actually, he's seen the full deformity and it horrifies him. And beyond these links of community, which in themselves made the most poignant part of his distress, he thought of Hyde for all his energy of life as of something not only hellish, but inorganic, okay? So there's something unnatural about Hyde. He is inorganic. He should not exist. And, you know, and actually, Jekyll may perhaps regrets ever kind of separating him from himself. This was the shocking thing, that the slime of the pit seemed to utter cries and voices, that the amorphous dust gesticulated and sinned, and what was dead and had no shape would usurp the offices of life, and this again, that that insurgent horror was knit to him closer than a wife. So again, comparing, they can be been compared to brothers in this book, fathers and sons, and now to like a husband and wife. Closer than I lay caged in his flesh. So he's trapped Hyde at the moment inside uh, Jekyll, where he heard it mutter and felt it struggle to be born. And at every hour of weakness and in the confidence of slumber prevailed against him and deposed him out of life. Deposed means kind of like, um, uh, kind of like, almost like stolen, really. Taken him out of life. Depositioned him out of life. So, so basically, like, you know, he's living this horror of this monster inside him that when he falls asleep is going to take uh, his appearance. The hatred of Hyde uh, for Jekyll was of a different order. So, um, just the, the way that um, Jekyll hates Hyde, Hyde hates Jekyll, but differently. His terror of the gallows drove him continually to commit temporary suicide, as in to change back to Jekyll. So he's like, oh, I might get caught by the law. Don't want to get um, uh, you know, strung up at the gallows. Well, then I'll change back to Jekyll to, to be safe and return to his subordinate station of a part instead of a person. But he loathed the necessity. So he hates having to do this. He hates having to become Jekyll to be safe. He loathed the despondency into which Jekyll was now fallen. And he resented the dislike with which he was himself to, uh, regarded. So he doesn't like. He resents being disliked by Jekyll. Hence the ape-like tricks. A little bit of a link back there to um, a quote from earlier in the book. Ape-like fury. Uh, which I think comes from the, when he killed um, Carew. And remember what I said then about this idea of being ape-like, that hides ape-like. It kind of links to the ideas of, of evolution and of uh, uh, Charles Darwin. Uh, okay, and, and so he would play these ape-like tricks on him. Uh, scrawling in my own hand, blasphemies on the pages of my books. Remember when um, Utterson and Paul went into his office, they found kind of like his books, all these kind of blasphemous things written on them. Um, so some strange kind of ideas there that Hyde's writing on, on his holy books. Burning the letters, uh, we, he, uh, Utterson also saw that, and destroying the portrait of my father. That's an interesting one, I think. I think, again, that idea that the father um, symbolises, like, his innocence. And Hyde is willing to kind of destroy that, completely destroy any memory of his innocence. Remember yesterday we talked about how he remembered when he held his father's hand, well now the portrait has been destroyed. And indeed had it not been for his fear of death, he would long ago have ruined himself in order to involve me in the ruin. So he's saying that, you know, Hyde would kill himself to kill Jekyll, but he doesn't want to kill himself, so that's why he doesn't do it. 
but his love of life is wonderful. So evil loves life, Hyde loves life. I go further, I who sicken and freeze at the mere thought of him, when I recall the objection and passion of, and of this attachment, and when I know how he fears my power to cut him off by suicide, I find it in my heart to pity him, as in, to like feel sorry for him. So again, Jekyll cannot separate himself from Hyde. He cannot fully hate him, even though he knows he, he fears him beyond anything. But he pities him. He can't do anything to, you know, he feels sorry for him, which again might make us think about how guilty Jekyll is in all this. It is useless and the time awfully fails me. So we're getting near the end of the book to prolong this description. No one has ever suffered such torments. Yeah, um, some hyperbole there, maybe. I mean, actually, he's kind of accurate, but he's feeling sorry for himself, isn't he? Um, let that suffice. And yet even to these habit brought no not alleviation but a certain callousness of soul callousness is like a hardening so his soul has become like hardened uh, a certain acquiescence of despair and my punishment might have gone on for years so he worried that this might happen for years him becoming hide and not being able to lose it but for the last calamity which has now fallen calamity is like disaster and which has finally severed me from my own face and nature so finally, he's been severed from being Jekyll forever. So he's, he's stuck as Hyde. My provision of the salt, remember the special salt that helps him make the, uh, the potion, which had never been renewed since the date of final page of the first experiment, began to run low. I sent out for a fresh supply and mixed the draft. The ebullition followed and the first change of colour, not the second. So it's like... Um, he can't recreate the potion anymore. I drank it and it was without efficiency. You will learn from Paul how I have had London ransacked. And, and we did learn that in last night. He told us about that, how he'd sent out messages to chemists and they couldn't help him. It was in vain. And I'm now persuaded that my first supply was impure. So he actually thinks now that perhaps, and, and one of his mistakes is that the first supply of salt he had was not pure. There was something weird about it. And that's what allowed him to do what he was able to do. And that it was that unknown impurity that lent efficacy to the draft. Efficacy means like me meant it was able to kind of actually like, like work. Um, uh, but actually, yeah, this unknown impurity, there's something impure that he's unable to uh, recreate. Last paragraph. About as a week has passed, and I am now finishing the statement under the influence of the last of the old power powders. So he's he's actually finishing this as Jekyll. This then is the last time, short of a miracle, that Henry Jekyll can think his own thoughts or see his own face. Now how sadly altered. So we get this kind of like we're going to get the demise now of Jekyll in this final paragraph in the glass. Nor must I delay too long to bring my writing to an end, for if my narrative has hitherto escaped destruction, it has been by a combination of great prudence and great good luck. So he's, he's actually talking now about this very chapter, about you know us reading it. Should the throes of change take me in the act of writing it, Hyde will tear it to pieces. So he's really worried, as, as a narrator, that Hyde will rip up exactly what we've just been reading and what Utterson is reading. But if some time shall have elapsed after I've laid it by, his wonderful selfishness and circumscription to the moment will probably save it once again from the action of his ape-like spite. We get that phrase again, ape-like. It's in the book three different times. And indeed, the doom that is closing on us both, doom, by the way, means kind of like death, ruin, that is closing on us both, has already changed and crushed him. Half an hour from now, when I shall again and forever re that hated personality, emphasis on forever, I know how I shall sh sit shuddering and weeping in my chair, or continue with the most strained and fear-struck ec ecstasy of listening to pace up and down this room. Do you remember in the last night when Utterson arrived, there was the pacing, there was the weeping, which we've had quite a lot in this book, um, my last earthly refuge, and give ear to every sound of menace. So remember, he was desperately waiting for, for kind of saving. Will Hyde die upon the scaffold? Or will he find the courage to release himself at the last moment? Will he, will he kind of, uh, will he, 
Will he? Will Hyde die? Like you know, will he be caught by kind of police, as in on a scaffold? Like will he be hanged, or will he release himself? Will he commit suicide? God knows. I am careless. This is my true hour of death. He's saying this is my my final hours. And what is to follow concerns another than myself. Here then, as I lay down the pen and proceed to seal up my confession, I bring the life of that unhappy Henry Jekyll to an end. Just to say this, he notice how one of the last things he does is he says, what is to follow concerns another than myself. He is insistent that Hyde is separate to Jekyll. However, that's something for us to question. Is he? Are they separate? Because they're, they're they're intertwined. They are all the evil in Hyde is the same evil that exists within Jekyll, just not balanced. And obviously, he lays down the pen, uh, and he ends the book, and he brings the, the brings to an end. Uh, obviously, he's confessed uh, the the life of that unhappy Henry Jekyll. Notice the word unhappy. You know, he had a pretty miserable existence and, he, and even when he tried to change that by becoming Hyde, he, he couldn't fully um, live that sort of life. So an interesting thought. And remember what happened in last night. They found because obviously the last night kind of carries on from the end of this letter in that we saw um, Hyde dead on the floor. So we know Hyde committed suicide, although I just want to leave you with one kind of thought. If you remember when it was described them seeing the body. They they saw they it looked like it was kind of twitching still, it was still kind of moving, and I wonder if even when Hyde committed suicide, that 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 Stevenson is hinting of the idea that the struggle between them carries on, perhaps spiritually, perhaps uh, you know in a, you know in the afterlife. But it's still perhaps even carrying on in their con in their mind, where even though they can't express it physically. So this idea that because the, the dead hide that the Utterson found, there's still kind of a battle going on because we never get a description of Hyde actually doing it. I mean, one reason for that, to be honest, might be because um, it would have been uh, it, it would have been seen as unacceptable um, in in kind of uh, in Victorian times. Like suicide is is dodgy ground for a book, and it probably wouldn't be published if it had a uh, quite um, you know graphic scene like that. Anyway, so that's the final chapter of the book, and therefore the final video in the series. Thanks for annotating along. I hope you got something from it.